Local government has faced more cuts than any other area since austerity began in 2010. More councils went bust in 2023 than in the 30 years before 2018, with eight effectively declaring bankruptcy since that year. Northamptonshire, Croydon, Slough, Northumberland, Thurrock, Woking, Birmingham and Nottingham. A survey from the Local Government Association found almost one in five councillors think it's likely their councils will go under by the end of this year because of a lack of funding to keep key services running. The top 10% of the poorest councils in England have suffered a 30% average cut in funding between 2010 and 2024, according to the Specialist Interest Group of Municipal Authorities. The same research found the richest 10% of councils have had a 10% cut on average in the same period. So why are councils going bust? To delve into what's happening in town halls across the country, I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by our policy correspondent, Megan Kenyon, who joined the New Statesman recently from the local government chronicle, and Johnny Ball, associate editor of the New Statesman's policy section, Spotlight. So thanks so much for joining me, both of you. And I feel like this is all nerds together because this is a subject that we've all covered for quite a long time, isn't it? Speak for yourself, Anish. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, you know, I've mentioned bankruptcy, but councils can't actually go bankrupt. So Megan, do you want to explain what it actually means if a council goes bankrupt? What does it do in this context? Yeah, so when a council goes effectively bankrupt, they issue what's called a section one one four notice, mm. um, which is issued by their chief financial officer. And it basically says, because councils have certain duties that they are legally required to do, they're able to still do those duties, but all other spending is, is frozen. So that's what it means. It's, it Councils can't technically go bankrupt, but that's what happens when we say section 114 notice. So, yeah. Yeah. And they send in commissioners from the government, don't they, to go and sort of make sure that they, they only spend on the things they're legally required to spend money on. That tends to be the case, yeah, although not always. Basically, the commissioners are there to hold their hands through any new spending decisions and um, any sell-offs that they might have to do as a result of the budget shortfalls, yeah. Right, OK. And so, Megan, you've got a, a fascinating tracker on the New Statesman's policy uh, section online, Spotlight, and I, I think all our listeners should go and have a look at it. I mean, I think I go on it at least three times a week. <laughs> There's this quite grim map on there showing which councils have gone under already and which are most at risk, and you're updating that. Can you take us through some of the places that have gone under and sort of the, the various reasons why that's happened. Yeah, so we're kind of tracking not only the ones that have gone under, but ones that could, yeah. ones that have got high levels of debt um, and ones that have kind of said they might in mm -hmm. the future. So the ones that have gone um, issued a section 114 most recently are, so Nottingham City Council was in November last year. Nottingham had actually issued a section 114 in 2021. Um, and that was down to basically they had used money from their housing revenue account, which is um, sort of some ring fenced funding, but also where money from social rent goes for the council. They had used money from that account for general spending, which councils aren't allowed to do. Right. Um, and when they discovered that unlawful spending, they couldn't then balance their budget. So they had to issue a section 114. The one that they issued last year was more to do with kind of what we're seeing more generally in local government, which is that demand for services is completely outstripping the amount of money that councils have to deliver them. Um, so in areas such as children's and adult social care and in housing, um, those are serious pressures. And I think Nottingham, you know, it had had some financial turbulence over the past few years and then got to 2023 and kind of found that on top of that, you know, government funding had not kept up with the amount of demand they'd had for the services they, they have to deliver, like social care. Yeah. Um, so that was one. Another was Birmingham, which was in September last year. Um, this one's slightly different in that there were several historic issues. So um, Birmingham Council is actually the largest... Um, council in the UK and um, basically they had had to issue a section 114 due to um, they had a £760 million bill to settle equal pay claims against mm. the council so um, they they just kind of found themselves unable to keep up with the number of claims that they had um, and they've actually said that so far the council spent £1 billion settling these equal pay claims but actually they estimate 
estimate that the remaining claims will cost a further £120 million. Wow, okay. Um, so, yeah. So that's like £1.1 billion pounds sort of yeah. because of this festering equal pay claim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite, it's it's massive. Um, but alongside that, and this is quite topical, they had tried to um, roll out a new IT system called Oracle, which had gone very badly <laughs> and actually ended up, it's ended up that it's expected to cost them £100 million pounds to rectify this sort of rubbish IT system, basically, right, okay. which is a lot of money um, against its annual budget, which is just under £3.2 billion pounds a year. Yeah, wow. So, yeah. It's interesting because in the cases of some of these collapsed councils, um, if we can call them that, there are some very specific circumstances that led to them having to issue a Section 114. And I remember going to Northamptonshire County Council, which was the first to go in this period since 2010. It was 2018. I don't think another council had gone under for 30 years before that one. Um, and it had made all sorts of poor financial decisions. It had tried to outsource loads of its services, um, including child protection services, the really fundamental services. And in some cases, it was being charged more than the market rate back for them. Um, and as well as that, it sort of had this attempt at a commercial property portfolio. When I went, I went to see this um, sparkling new council building called One Angel Square, you know, all ang angles and exciting copper and glass. <laughs> and they'd actually had to sell it off um, four months after they'd bought it for £53 million. Pounds, and it was kind of like this symbol, this white elephant in the centre of town that represented its profligacy. And you've seen similar things happening in Woking, um, Croydon tried to create its own in-house um, housing developer and that created some white elephant redevelopments as well. But obviously the circumstances like you hinted at there, Megan, um, for making poor financial decisions and trying to save money in these innovative but ill thought through ways are common of all councils. And you, meant, you, you mentioned um, social care temporary accommodation and other pressures that are, that are on um, councils. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, but also the fact that they councils were encouraged to invest, weren't they? They were encouraged to make these kind of investments and the Audit Commission was abolished in 2015. And so that kind of set the scene for making riskier bets. Yeah. And uh, I think something that had happened in 2020 was um, the Public Works uh Public Work Loans Board um, before there had kind of been a commission which oversaw loans but now that's gone directly to the Treasury so I think it I think when that happened there was kind of a lot of concern that you know we're getting ourselves into a bit of trouble with councils potentially taking out loans that aren't then kind of being signed off properly or have the proper scrutiny I mean the audit backlog in local government at the moment is is so is so backed up and has been for some time. I, I mean, for example, Woking, you know, its accounts hadn't been signed off for several years when it issued a Section 114 notice. And I think if there were the proper checks and balances there, it might not have got to a state where it, it faced a £1.2 billion deficit against core funding of £16 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, Thurrock is another great example. I went there um, last year and that's that went. Um, bust at the end of 2022 and they just made some extraordinary um, investment decisions on things that have absolutely nothing to do with the town so investing in solar farms as far away as Wiltshire and they just didn't get a return on those investments but the private investors that had been tasked perfectly legally with with investing this money made a lot from it um, and so you've got a broke town and sort of some people who've done quite well out of it and um, a council that clearly didn't have the expertise to invest in the way that, you know, people who are experts in that field might do. Um, and before we get on to um, what kind of pressure councils are under, Johnny, you've been surveying councillors in England um, and you've had some pretty interesting results. So do you want to take us through how they're feeling about the viability of their own councils and also the cuts that they're having to make? Absolutely, yeah. It should be said that this poll was conducted sort of late last year um, but it does kind of mirror other polls that other organisations have, have done like the local government association poll that you mentioned earlier that said I think it was uh, one in five councils think it would be likely or very likely that they'll have to issue one of these section 114 bankruptcy notices um, we had a very similar result it was around 528 councillors and we actually got a slightly high on, higher number on the bankruptcy question than the LGA it was almost a quarter of councillors mm -hmm. said that they would um, be likely 
um, or very likely to go bankrupt. Um, and that included a lot of conservative councillors as well. This wasn't a party political problem. And I think the government have tried to present it a little bit as a party political problem, saying that this is sort of profligate. Um, Labour councils who don't know how to manage their budgets. Um, but this is something you're seeing across the board now. As you mentioned, there were there are governance issues um, in Birmingham um, and the issue with the uh, outstanding legal claims for their, their, their pay issues from the 1970s, I think that dates back to. And also Nottingham have governance issues that are longstanding. They set up a... Um, a publicly owned energy company called Robin Hood Energy, um, which went completely bust and made a real pig's ear of it. They didn't have the expertise or the personnel to set up an energy company and it, um, it, it very quickly went south. But a lot of these investments, as you said, have been made by Tory councils as well. Um, and what's really spurred it on has been that sort of that cut between, between like 30 percent and sometimes two thirds of their of their revenue support grants that they get from government. So they just had to compensate with that cut somewhere. So they got into the commercial property market, real estate market, all kinds of things, buying hotels. Um, for some councils, it's gone OK. Um, and for example, Liverpool Council, they own the, the I know they own the, the conference centre that Labour Party conferences often, often held in every year that we all go to. That must make the council a fortune, although Liverpool has its own governance issues, which aren't necessarily related to issuing section 114s, but are separate to that. We won't go into that. <laughs> That's a whole other episode. That's a whole Johnny. other episode, yeah. <laughs> Don't take us down that rabbit hole. <laughs> exactly. I'll never shut up if we do. <laughs> but the other thing our poll found... Um, bit of sort of qualitative response that I thought was interesting from a Labour councillor, all, all remaining anonymous, but one said that um, a massive worry is that Labour won't make that much difference. I haven't seen any signs of a better settlement for local authorities. And without that, we are all slipping closer to the abyss. That was a direct quote from one of them. And I interviewed the shadow minister for local government last year, Alec, Alex Norris. He's now shadow minister for policing, which tells you a little bit about the sort of churn you get in the sort of ministerial and shadow ministerial local government position. It's now Jim McMahon, who was the DEFRA secretary at one point. Um, but he was also leader of Oldham Council at one point. So it's not like he doesn't know his stuff. But I, I, I pushed Alex Norris a few times to say, will you restore that council funding to sort of 2010 levels, more towards 2010 levels? Um you know, if you, you got one in four saying that they're, they're likely or very likely to go bankrupt, that could be 70, 80 bankrupt cities or, or town councils. Um, and he wouldn't commit to it, basically. He kept saying, um, you've got to have to wait till a manifesto. And given the fiscal constraints that the Labour Party keep emphasising that they're going to be under, um, a lot of councillors, according to this poll um, and other polls that other organisations have carried out, a lot of councillors are, are feeling very bleak about the sort of fiscal outlook in the next few years. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, let's come on to that because um, I think Angela Rayner has recently said that it will be a long slog rather than a magic wand to help sort of fix town halls if Labour get into power, which doesn't sound like there's a big settlement forthcoming. And actually, that brings problems of its own. I heard from a Labour councillor up in Yorkshire who was saying, actually, there's a lot of councils that think or assume Labour's going to be more generous when it comes into government. So are still spending, are spending as if like a big solution is round the corner and actually mm. getting more closer and closer to bankruptcy because of that perhaps false hope. We don't know. We don't know what Labour will do if they get in. So that's one problem. But and another is that they do have this policy of a fair wage settlement for social care workers. And that would be in their first 100 days in office, they say. And while, you know, this, the principle of it is lauded by Labour councillors, of course, <laughs> they've been saying to me, what, what does that mean for the viability of our council? Because a lot of council funding, as we'll come on to, is spent on the social care system. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, you look at Birmingham, one of the issues um, with their uh, Section 114 was actually kind of not being able to keep up with um, rising wages. Yeah. Because I think that's something we see sort of every year or every year when I was at LGC was covering, so the pay settlement would come out, which is often done through the local government association, um, so they set the pay for council workers yeah. and then the unions would kind of be on their back saying you're not giving us enough money but that money has to come out of the council budget I mean obviously I'm not saying people shouldn't get fair pay <laughs> but I think you know it's all wrapped up in the same thing isn't it it's kind of like how do you solve so many issues issues like housing social care children's social care um, ensuring people in the public sector are paid a fair wage without kind of solving the issue of council funding. I think it's such a big question for Labour. 
Yeah, and and I think as we've talked about Labour, we should probably talk about what the government has sort of agreed to do to try and fix um, the situation. So there was um, some funding announced at the end of last year, £64 billion worth. I mean, that sounds like a huge amount of money, but it's not enough, is it? Um, And the local government association came out and said it wasn't enough and there'd still be a £2 billion funding gap this year. I think Tory MPs actually wrote to Rishi Sunak and asked him for more money because otherwise there would be significant cuts needed this year. Um, It amounts to a 6.5% increase in funding, so less than the 9.4% 9. 9. rise they had last year. Um, but why isn't that enough? I mean, that figure will sound huge to our listeners. It is a huge amount of money, yeah. But um, inflation in those specific sectors that um, Megan mentioned, housing and social care, adult social care, children's services, um, is much higher than the national rate of inflation, which, as we all know, has been massive over the last few years. So social care can take up more than half of most local authorities' budgets. So if inflation in costs in that sector going up by uh, 15 20%, um, then they're going to need much more than um, the 6% settlement that they got from this $64 billion. So I think the LGA said that even with that settlement, there's a $4.5 billion shortfall. Um I think sometimes people forget uh, how many services local authorities are responsible for. That sixty-four billion's got to deliver a huge, huge amount of stuff: um, housing and adult social care, as we mentioned, but also lots of schools, uh, transport plans, um, and underfunding these services really acts as a bottleneck for a lot of sort of national issues that we're seeing coming to the fore at the moment. Social care, I suppose, coming back to it being the main one because of the pressures that creates for the NHS nationally. If social care isn't pro- properly funded, um, then that, that creates sort of bottlenecks in beds in hospitals. Um, also issues like planning, which is really a hot topic for the Labour Party, for both parties at the moment. Planning departments have been completely decimated. So underfunding local government cre- creates bottlenecks in all sorts of areas that I don't think... Um, is widely appreciated. Yeah. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think a lot of our listeners will be thinking, I thought this was going to be a podcast about councils. So why aren't they talking about bins and fly tipping mm-hmm. and libraries and leisure centres and all of those things, you know, councils do have um, some resp- responsibility over. But ultimately, and this is something that I was told by the leader of Somerset Council, who I went to go and see last week as he was trying to work out what cuts he needed to make for the budget. Um, he was saying, actually, you know, we are, se- we are essentially a, a, an adult social care service being funded by a tax um, that's based on property values that were decided in 1991. And he was like, who would start with this model? You know, who- <laughs> this system is not something that you would you would think up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so do you think there is this sort of like, do you think it's sort of more of a phil- philosophical question about what councils are actually for, Megan? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I think I have lots of opinions on this. (laughs) Um, I think something that has definitely kind of emerged over the past few years is a question of, okay, well, what are councils kind of actually for? (laughs) If if all they can deliver is social care or housing and even then they are bursting at the seams trying to deliver it. If you're a councillor, so say you're running for election at the May elections, you've never been worked in a council before you have probably had some experience in local campaigning whatever but you've not actually been involved in the council you run on a on a campaign of okay I'm gonna really make cycle lanes (laughs) brilliant in my town and then you get in and you look at your budget and you think oh but where's the money going to come from because you know 80% of our budget is going on social care there's sort of a bit left for for housing, rehousing homeless people. Oh, there's no money for my for my cycle lanes. You know, that's kind of a, a simplistic example. But I think it does beg the question of if people are trying to make actual change in their communities, how are they going to do it if if our public services are so hollowed out? I think that is a genuine question, but one that is quite difficult to ask. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, this brings us on to what the actual real life consequences are for this crisis that councils are in. Um, and we've all visited, I mean, we all live <laughs> we all live in a council area ourselves, but we've all visited them in the course of our reporting. And you can really see it, you know, in, in the state of the public, public realm, you know, swings broken in playgrounds that are tied to their posts, haven't been fixed for weeks, litter in the streets. Um, when I went to go and visit, 
uh, Thurrock, there was, you know, overflowing bins. The council tax had gone up 10% in April. It's going up by a similar amount again this year. People were really sort of struggling with rising parking costs and anywhere that the council could try and make up a bit of money, they were. I mean, even the cost of burials and mm. interments of people's ashes had gone up. You know, even the dead weren't spared this situation in Thurrock. Um, similar in Hastings, where one of the big issues, and we've we've mentioned housing, but this is temporary accommodation councils must provide by law for people who are made homeless. The cost of housing in Hastings has gone up a lot, and there's there's a very limited supply, and so they're 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 spending a huge proportion of their budget, an unsustainable portion, on temporary accommodation. Mm. So much so that the, the leader of the council there called for a homes for Ukraine style scheme, not for refugees, but for locals to be housed in people's spare rooms and like structures in their gardens. So you can really tell sort of when you're walking around that areas are suffering and not being maintained in the way that we might remember from, you know, when when we were growing up or our parents' generation might remember. Yeah, absolutely. And this doesn't affect all councils evenly. Um, poorer local authority areas will feel this a lot more because they have far less ability to make up um, the sort of deficits they've got because of the cuts um, than richer local authorities do. So um, they'll have uh, far more houses in lower um sort of council tax property bans so they can't up the council tax by as much or the revenues from council tax can't be up by as much and also their business rate opportunities are far far fewer um if you're in a if you're if you're in a council like Blackpool or um, Nosley Kirby the, your your business rate revenue is going to be very different to say the councils in Westminster or Kensington and London Borough of Kensington and Chelsea for example so um the the richer councils in the more sort of um dynamic metropolitan London borough councils or perhaps the sort of richer county councils have been able to sort of deal with that gap a lot more effectively than the poorer councils and I think the other thing to say is like one of the one of the things that came out in this poll is basically a sort of universal acceptance that the sort of standard everyday things that you used to think the council will provide, like libraries, uh, swimming pools, leisure centres, those are just slowly disappearing. Um, hundreds and hundreds have been, have been closed since 2010. As we've mentioned, this has been like the hardest hit government department by austerity when Eric Pickles became the DCLG, Department for Communities and Local Government Secretary in 2010. George Osborne asked everybody to go away and find cuts. Yeah. Um, and it was extremely easy for Eric Pickles to make cuts because he just basically outsourced them to 317 English councils. And as Megan was saying earlier, the councillors are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They might be, they might have loads of great ideas and an incredible manifesto even full of or you know loads of idealistic visions of what they want to put in a manifesto but basically what they've been reduced to is administering cuts sort of sent down over the last sort of 10 to 15 years by Eric Pickles and all of his successors. Yeah, and it's easy to do in the sense that um, a lot of the spending that councils do is known as discretionary spending because a lot of that is fundamental stuff, isn't it? The discretionary spending like youth clubs and sports facilities and pest control and all of these things that you'd assume councils have to do. The Somerset Council leader walked me through the centre of Taunton to show me the bits that he was going to have to cut. It was really sad. Um, but, you know, there was a, a bus service, um, flower beds that would win competitions in the in the park. You know, these things are important. Um, funding for the theatre, an adult um, with learning disabilities employment service, um, all of these um, listed buildings that the council might have to sell off, even the museum. So it's, it's, it's things that you assume the council has to be behind. Actually, he was like, it's all discretionary. We don't have to spend money on it. And in order to save money to spend on things we have to provide legally, we we are going to have to make cuts in some of these areas. And so I think there's, um, again, it comes back to the question of what councils are for, but also the way that it, you know, the way that these cuts are done, like you say, it was seen as probably quite easy pickings at the beginning of the era of austerity. And now it's very much sort of coming back to bite not just councils, but the national government, because we've had this run of councils going under in a short space of time. It's looking more like a, a, a national issue rather than the pro a problem of individual councils making bad decisions. I think one area where this is really stark is in public health. Yeah. I mean, public health funding um, has been cut by 25% since 2015. So I think the person that is really great on this is Michael Marmot. Mm -hmm. He basically says we were um, the unhealthiest we've been this country was going into the pandemic and so much of that was because essential public health services had been had been cut 
you know, through through austerity. And I think that hasn't reached, you know, the funding for public health hasn't reached the levels of before it being cut. Um, and I think like, you know, we were so unhealthy going into COVID and public health services are so vital to keeping people healthy and going into a pandemic where, you know, your health is so vital, <laughs> being in that position, it really showed. I think we were, you know, I don't think anyone would argue that we weren't hit really badly by the pandemic. And part of that can be then tied back into the cuts to local government funding. It really does span into everything mm. in the public yeah. sector. Mm. The other thing that just came to mind is, that, I mean, the government are having difficulty now because they're having to sort of, um, I, I don't think there'll be a sector-wide bailout. I think they'll carry on doing sort of ad hoc rescues of councils mm -hmm. as and when they sort of issue their bankruptcy or Section 114 notices. But they're getting to a stage where it's not just a sort of financial threat to central governments, but also where central government is unable to implement policies that they've passed in national legislation. So the Renters Reform Bill, um, which is banning no-fault evictions, supposedly, I've spoken to councillors who just say there's absolutely no way that the provisions in this bill can be enforced by local authorities, which they're meant to be, because um, housing officers or environmental officers, as they are in local authorities, environmental officers have just been completely decimated. They don't have the personnel, the expertise or the experience to to, to basically implement the legislation that the government's passing. Um, and we also, we already mentioned the impact that social care cuts are having on the NHS nationally. Um, and planning departments, but as you say, it just it just feeds through into every issue nationally, yeah. having these um, sort of false economies made over over a decade or more. Well, yeah, planning is a really good example of that because you have all of these promises actually on both sides of how the planning system might be overhauled, but then you go to a councillor and they're like, "Well, our planning department is <laughs> has been decimated, so we can't actually." They don't know. even have local plans. A lot of councils. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I did an investigation for LGC last year. Sorry plug for it. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, um, I sent out a lot of FOIs and found that only one in 10 council planning departments were fully staffed. So I think, wow. yeah, <laughs> so it really is that bad. <laughs> um, and we we touched on council tax, but can one of you take us through how ridiculous a tax it is, please? Because this is one of the ways that councils can spend money. Um, but as I mentioned, in England, at least, you know, it's based on valuations of properties that were made in 1991 and think of the housing inflation that we've had since then and it's a it's a very regressive tax as well isn't it yeah i suppose uh reforming the council tax system is is desperately needed um and i think you know several governments have said they'll do it and pushed it into the long grass i remember being at a select committee meeting um that was michael gove was in front of the leveling up committee and he said to um, to the committee, oh, yes, uh, Lee Rowley, who was at the time the mm -hmm. local government minister, now the housing minister, <laughs> after having already been the housing minister. Um, yeah, Lee Rowley's looking into it. Jeremy Hunt and I have, have said, Lee, you go, you take it. Um, anyway, Lee Rowley then got asked several times whether he was doing this council tax review. And it was always kind of, well, I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it. You know, so I think... Um, yeah, the system itself is 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 desperately in need of reform, but it's it's so the reforms that need to be done are so big. I mean, for example, I think I saw a, a stat in the Economist that kind of said that um, Buckingham Palace <laughs> pays less council tax over a year than a three bed property in. Blackpool, basically. <laughs> um, so you can see from Seems that, it, it doesn't really work, <laughs> does it? Um, but I think, you know, one thing I would say, that 64 billion that we mentioned, um, kind of that had been given to councils yeah. as part of the financial settlement, a lot of that, or a, a part of that is is contingent on councils raising council tax. So, you know, yeah. they, they're getting this funding from government. Some councils actually don't even get any revenue support grant, you know, Kingston and London because it was cut so much that, that they just don't get it anymore. So council tax actually is is vital for councils in terms of raising income, but it's just really not a very effective way to do that because of the way it's distributed across the country. And it, it just, yeah, it, it's, it just doesn't work. Well, it's ironic, isn't it? Because Rishi Sunak has urged councils for, to, to do restrained tax rises, <laughs> but then these T council tax rises are factored into that 64 yeah. billion. And that's a 5% um, council tax rise, yeah. isn't it? Which is the highest they can go. 
um, because the government caps it, but they can ask for permission to go higher. In Thurrock, they'd, or they'd do be a referendum. Informed. Yeah, or do a referendum. It's a referendum after 3%, right? And then, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that, they can go up to 499 um, but in some places, the government has granted permission to go higher. So in Thurrock, it was 9.99 last year. And Birmingham have re requested yeah. if they can go to 20 by 20 percent of it, I think, this year. Wow. I mean, having issues a section 114. That's shocking. Um, and I mean, just to bring us to an end, Megan, you've been looking at other councils that are potentially in trouble. I wondered if you could take us through some of the places that we should keep an eye on. Yeah. So I think I have kind of um, you can kind of split it into two issues basically it's either housing is going to cause these councils to tip over the edge or it's social care mm -hmm. so um some key examples i can pick off the top of my head are havering council in in london um that housing is a massive issue and and is for a lot of for a lot of london boroughs temporary accommodation has just ballooned and is so expensive because no longer are you having councils housing people in in flats and sort of traditional temporary accommodation more and more families are being placed in b&b or hotel accommodation which is so expensive mm. um so havering and then hastings which you mentioned both have housing issues i mean yeah, a, a kind of an example of how badly this is affecting Havering. I saw a story this week that said they're actually considering turning their street lights down because they can't afford to keep them on full full beam, which is great for the women living in Havering. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then obviously Somerset, which you mentioned, um, has got obviously massive problems with social care. Yeah. Um, another council is Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool Council, which is quite an interesting one um, <laughs> for various reasons. Their main issue is with SEND provision, so special educational needs provision. Yeah. Um, and they have had a sort of black hole in their budget in terms of dealing with that because um, it's just so expensive to, uh, to run these services. Um, but another interesting thing about BCP was that they... Um, became a unitary council uh, in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, and as part of that, so a unitary council is created from the merger of, of several councils. So mm -hmm. it covers one area instead of having two, three, tiers or, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. two or three constituent districts covering an area. Um, BCP went unitary. They initially had the Unity Alliance, <laughs> who was uh, everybody else but the Tories, <laughs> running the council. In 2020, the Tories took over and realised that they had um, a big gap in the in the council's transformation programme, which had arisen out of um, the, the unitarisation process that they needed to fill. So they thought, what are we going to do? <laughs> and the idea that they had was, I don't know if anyone listening is from Bournemouth, <laughs> but you guys have great beach huts. <laughs> um, and some of those beach huts belong to the council. The council thought, OK, we'll set up a new company that is owned by the council to sell the beach huts to this new company oh. from the council, then the council will buy them back. Um, and This is yeah. so classic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was apparently going to raise the amount of money they needed to fill the gap in their transformation programme. Um, Greg Clark, who was the levelling up secretary at the time, about three levelling up secretaries ago, um, stepped in and said, BCP, you cannot do that. Please do not do that. That is too risky. So, yeah, they're on our radar as well. Right. But it's not for the Beach Huts reason because they didn't do that in the end. So, yeah. I love how it was like everything else was fine for 14 years or whenever. And then the yeah. Beach Huts. No, we draw a line at that, actually. Yeah. The government's yeah, yeah. stepping in. So. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much, both of you. Um, it's been a really, really interesting chat. I know all of this is quite technical stuff, um, but you've you've talked about it in such a in such a um enlightening and accessible way so i really appreciate it and we'll definitely have you back on to to keep an eye on this situation because surely more councils will be going under this year thanks so much for watching we'd love to know what you think please make sure you leave your comments below and if you enjoyed watching this podcast you can watch more of our videos on our youtube channel and don't forget to like and subscribe